Hey everyone, and thank you very much for coming along to my talk this evening. My name is Dr. Katie Strang, and I am a paleontologist and geologist, and I'm secretary and one of the trustees for the Scottish Geology Trust. And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about Scotland's Carboniferous fossils and some of the really awesome sites that we have and what that kind of tells us about these past environments that used to, to prevail over Scotland uh, over 300 million years ago. But first of all, as always, I'm just going to do a, a brief wee summary of the Scottish Fossil Code. Now, we want you to go out and collect fossils and enjoy yourself, but it's really important that you do have a look at this. So because we do have such a great fossil heritage, it's really important to sign this and we must protect it for our future generations as well. So if you're keen to collect fossils, then read this code first. You can find it on the Nature Scott website. And I've also put a link, is there a QR code down there in the corner for you? Um, and it sets out the best practice for collecting, for IDing, for conserving, and how to store your fossil specimens even. Um, and it's a really, really great resource. And this is a, a screenshot of the a leaflet, which you can download from the Nature Scott website. And it just goes into sort of detail about the different areas of fossil hunting. So if you're going to go and collect, then you must uh, have a look at the area you're going and if needed, seek permission from the landowner or whoever it is that maintains that part of, of the land. Now, it might be that you are going to a restricted site, which is a triple SI, somewhere that is a site of scientific special interest. If that's the case, then it's very likely there is no collecting allowed or permitted. Um, so do check up on that before visiting somewhere. And if you're not sure, then get in touch with someone. And um, there's lots of people there. You're welcome to contact me on Twitter or uh, through email address through the Scottish Geology Trust. And um, I can help you out or point you into the direction of someone who would know. And we ask that you access responsibly. So we do have a right of access in Scotland, but that doesn't actually really extend to collecting stuff from people's land. So it's always best and just good practice to ask a landowner before you collect any material from their land. And collect responsibly. So please don't over collect. That is a big, big issue. And please never, ever, ever hammer bedrock. If you do think that you've seen something very, very important in a, in a bit of bedrock, so that means when the rock is actually still like, you know, attached to the land, um, please get in touch with someone like a museum who will be able to send someone to assess that fossil. And um, then the decision will be made about whether or not it was worth extracting that from the, the bedrock. But otherwise, um, hammering bedrock is a big no, we don't want to damage that geology, we want to protect that for as long as we can. And seek advice if you're not sure and you're not sure whether you've got permission to go somewhere or if you aren't sure about what you've found, if you need a, if you need a hand to ID something, there's lots of people that are willing to help. And that includes museums or you might have a local geological society or you can get in contact with uh, Paleontology Twitter and we all love to uh, have a wee mystery fossil to ID. And um, when you do collect something, it's good to sort of keep a record of where you found it and do a wee label. So, you know, like what date you found it, things like that. And that means that, you know, in the future, further down the line, if you decide you want to be a paleontologist, then you might come back to these fossils and think, oh, where did I find that one? So it's always good to have that record. And if you are donating to a museum, then consider who you're donating it to and if possible, take it to someone to a museum that is local to the area where you found that material. And this page just shows you the other side of the leaflet that you can get and it tells you a bit more about the different kinds of fossils that you can find in Scotland. And yeah, there is some absolutely amazing stuff out there and we do encourage people to go out and to have a look at their natural heritage. But as we say, it's just always important that we do protect that for future generations and for scientists to be able to study. So please do take care, but also enjoy yourself and let me see pictures of cool fossils because I always love that. But what I'm going to do now is just sort of go into a brief overview of uh, the Carboniferous. Now, I'm starting with the end Devonian. You might wonder why that is, but it's quite important. So here we are. Um, the end Devonian is about uh, 360 million years ago. And at this point, there was sort of a mass extinction event. And this mass extinction event was associated with the disappearance of what were called placoderms. That's uh, this big armoured fish you can see here. And uh, these heavily head shielded fish 
were massive predators in their time. So at the end of the Devonian, when a lot of the life in the ocean went extinct, it meant that there was sort of a evolutionary opportunity for other uh, marine animals to sort of exploit. And that was meant that there was a major, major radiation among things like sharks, which are the chondrichthyans, and the osteichthyans, which are the fish, and also tetrapods. And um, these uh, other groups were sort of affected by later extinctions in the Permian, where there was a massive extinction event. Um, but this end Devonian extinction, where these big predators in the, the seas went extinct, that really did create an opportunity for this sort of next uh, wave of evolution. When you go into the Carboniferous, it's even called uh, the Golden Age of Sharks. And that was just because they didn't have these big armor predators anymore, and they were able to exploit and adapt to more evolutionary niches than before. But going into the very early Carboniferous now, um, you have to imagine that Scotland was, looked very, very different uh, to what we do now. So we were part of a, a larger supercontinent. And at that time, Scotland was at very low lying latitudes uh, close to the equator. That meant we had a hot and humid climate and we had very different conditions to what we experience today in modern Scotland. And to start off, what I'm going to do is, um, this is the geological timeline from the BGS, and it just shows you the kind of, um, the different stages that the Carboniferous has broken up to, just in, in case you hear me say certain terms. So at the very early Carboniferous here, we have what's called the Ternasian, and I'm going to talk about that in a wee second. Um, a lot of what you'll hear me talk about is this one here, which is the Visean, and that is because a lot of the rocks that I'm currently looking at and working on are from this period and um, happens to be the rocks around where I live as well. And um, yeah, you'll see these terms uh, quite regularly, but as I said, I'm going to start with the Ternasian. Now, I grew up in a very small fishing village um, down in the Scottish borders called Barnmouth. And being young, eh, I was always absolutely fascinated by the fact that the rocks, this is a picture of Burnmouth here, um, the rocks are vertical. And that uh, vertical, uh, those vertical rocks, that is to do with um, the closing of the Apis Ocean and to do with the pres presence of uh, igneous chambers underneath the ground, uh, sort of local to this area. And um, really, really interesting geology. But what a lot of people don't know about um, is that in recent years, there has been some absolutely amazing research being carried out. And the rocks at Burnmouth are from this age, which is the Ternasian. And it's here you can see on the map, it's on the coast. So it's just before you reach the border, Barrack upon Tweed is just over here. And Eyemouth is just there, that's where I went to school. And Burnmouth, that's where I grew up and where my parents still live. And it is a really, really fabulous part of the world. And one of the people who did a lot of collecting in this area was a guy called Stan Wood, who you've probably all heard of. Um, he does amazing, amazing work. And then the research team, which was called the Tweed Project, um, that looked at this was uh, fronted by Professor Jennifer Clack. And it was absolutely amazing. The website you can look at is online. If you look up Tweed Project, that'll come up and it's got a lot of fascinating resources on there. Now at this bit of Burnmouth, um, it's the most complete surface exposure of the Balagan formation, that's these rocks from the Ternasian stage. And it, on the foreshore at Burnmouth, they are about 520 metres in all, and it's mainly characterised by a type of rock known as cement stone, and recent work has recognised several different types of these carbonate or dolomitic uh, units. And the cement stones do include other uh, lithologies. So there's micro conglomerates, which are the main tetrapod uh, or bone bearing beds, uh, laminated embedded sandstones and siltstones. And there is a wide variety of different types of sedimentary structures and features. Now you can see here where the rocks are almost vertical and the softer rocks like the shale are being weathered and eroded out a lot faster. And it gives you this really, really rugged coastline and as a kid, uh, you have no idea how many times I uh, destroyed my legs falling and crawling about these rocks. All great fun. But what's important about this particular stage in the Canadian is that it's a period known as Romer's Gap. Now, we have evidence from the Devonian of when fish started to sort of move to land, when the sort of first tetrapod-like animals appeared. 
And it wasn't until later in the Carboniferous and the Vicean when we had evidence of tetrapods actually being on land. And there was a scientist called Romer who he realised that there was this missing gap and, you know, what happened in this time period, they seem to, you know, we know that they evolved to walk onto land because we have that evidence from later on, but what happened at this particular part of the early Carboniferous? And Barnmouth has been super important for this and the other localities nearby in the Scottish borders. And that is because we, um, well, scientists were able to have a look and they're able to find evidence of the first tetrapods in some of these beds here. So uh, here's a slide telling you a little bit about uh, Romer's Gap, and it was a hiatus in the fossil records, as I said, where uh, we had no evidence of these tetrapods. Now, the sort of columns, the logs on the right hand side are uh, stratigraphic columns which have been done um, as part of these projects looking into Birdmouth. <clears throat> and they show a very uh, varied lithology, which like I said, and research by Professor Clack et al showed that tetrapods of the Balgan formation lived in a variety of floodplain environments. And uh, some would have been underwater for long periods, others alternated between land surface and standing water. So there was a lot of fluctuations. So these animals kind of had to be uh, adaptable to this changing environment. And here it is, just in case you don't know what a tetrapod looks like or an early tetrapod, and it's a very famous one called Rebo, and this uh, artwork is by an artist called Karen Carr. And these are some of the CT scans of some of the tetrapods material that has been found at Barmouth, along a bit called Ross, which is uh, where my auntie lived. And um, this is from one of Clark's, uh, Professor Clack's papers from 2016. And it's absolutely amazing uh, because I don't work with vertebrates like this. Um, I find it absolutely mind blowing that we can take these tiny, tiny little bits of bone and piece that together and find out so much information that's so important to our overall knowledge of not only this time period, but also to the evolution of humans ourselves. But now um, I just had to put that in because obviously I grew up there and uh, it's a very special place to me and um, I love being able to talk about Barmouth whenever I can, but I do actually now live in Fife. So now we're going to move into the Bicean stage. Um, this stage is from about 345 million years ago to about 326 million years ago. And these are uh, the low-lying areas which have, through those sort of ice ages and millions and millions of years of erosion, are now sort of low lying and the green and sort of pink areas you can see are the volcanic rocks of the area. Now around Fife there's some really really interesting interactions between the volcanics and the sediments and um, which is really cool but the uh, volcanics you can see here these green ones are intrusive cells and this one here is at Inverkeething and it's where the fourth rail bridge is built and that is because that headland is obviously very very hard igneous rock. And the rest of the material you can see are divided up into these groups. And um, you don't need to worry too much about these different names. These are just used by uh, geologists to help us locate where we are in the formation. So we know which rocks are the same as other rocks. And we use things like fossils to try and uh, correlate those rocks. And the one that you'll probably hear me talking a lot about today is the Strathclyde group. Now this uh, map here is a map which is sort of overlain on a map of Scotland. I'm going to point out the coast here so you can see. So here is the Firth of Forth in there and you've got Edinburgh around about here. Now overlain on that is something called Lake Cadell. Now in the early Carboniferous, um, in this region of Scotland, we had then the formation of this lake called Lake Cadell. And around the margins of this lake was very, very variable. So it wasn't all just one lake that had the same sedimentation. Lots of different environments and habitats for different animals and different types of animals to exploit and to live in. And Lake Cadell is really, really interesting in the types of animals that you find, but also some of the preservation that you find from these rocks as well. And you can see, um, in the Midland Valley here, we're bound at the top by the Highland Boundary Fault and at the bottom by the Southern Uplands Fault. And that's why you do get some slight difference in the rocks between the two. And I'll, I'll come back, you'll hear me mention Lake Cadell as well as we look at some of the different 
sort of animals and things that you get there. So this is a place called uh, Cheese Bay. Now this is the bay next to Cheese Bay, but um, the rocks here belong to what's known as the Gullane Formation and comprise a sequence of cement stones, dolly stones and mudstones and shales. And the rocks have been altered nearby by a dolerite cell. <clears throat> and uh, one of the beds uh, yields a really, really rich and diverse assemblage of Bicean marine fossils. And this includes orthopods, fish and fish scales, and pirateized plant remains, and shrimp fauna, and lots and lots of fossil jobbies, which I love. Um, it's a really beautiful place um, to walk along this part of the coast. The best place to stop is at Yellow Craigs and walk down the way. This again is a triple SI, so obviously no hammering of bedrock or anything when you're there. But what we have here um, is what is known as sort of a lager satin. This is the gully and shrimp bed. And what you find here are these absolutely incredible uh, fossils known as Teleocaris. This is Teleocaris lindensis. And these shrimps are commonly associated with other fossils, like I said. And due to this, they're being interpreted as a marginal marine, brackish, lagoonal, hypersaline, and freshwater in origin in their environment. Now, that might just sound like a lot of words, but what that is essentially saying is that with some sort of environment, if it's lagoonal, it means at some point it is being cut off and being isolated. Um, marginal marine means that it is periodically likely to experience uh, some incursions by the sea. And hypersaline, uh, as, it, as it sounds, just means that there would probably be a lot of salt but also it was actually fresh water in origin. So the, the source of the water would not have been coming from uh, the marine, even though there would have been periodic periods where the sea level would rise or influ influx into there. And the rocks here, you can see there's all these calcite veins running through. Now these rocks are super, super hard. Now, most of the bed is not, not visible at all at outcrop. It can only be seen sometimes at a very, very low tide. Occasionally you can so find some of these pebbles. Um, but because of over collecting in the past, it is recommended not to do that and to gain permission before you were to go to this, uh, to this site. But this, what's really cool about this is even though the rock's really, really hard, uh, the reason for that is because it has been basically baked by the nearby dolerite cell. And then um, all these cracks have been later infilled by calcite. And the shrimps themselves that you can see, um, these are preserved in a phosphate and they look really cool under UV light because of that. But you can just see how amazing that preservation is. You can see all the appendages here and the antennae and they're just absolutely incredible. And here are some other examples you can see with these big calcite veins running through as well. And because the um, body has been replaced by fluorapatite or phosphate, it, that's what's given it this exceptional, exceptional preservation. And you can see this one up in the corner is kind of side on, and this one is on a top view. And that down there is a little coprolite as well. So this rock, as I say, is full of other material too. And you can see some really nice examples of these in uh, the Hunterian and the National Museum of Scotland in their collections. And there's some beautiful, collect uh, beautiful ones that were collected by Stan Woods um, when he discovered this first discovered this locality. Now we're just moving a bit further up the coast now from a uh, sort of East Lothian way up towards Edinburgh where uh, we have the Grant and Shrimp Beds. Now the Grant and Shrimp Bed is what's known as a Lagerstat as well. So a Lagerstat is just a site of exceptional fossil preservation. And <clears throat> this is really near uh, the centre of Edinburgh and it's principally known because of the conodon animal. So conodonts were a mystery for a while. So this bottom image here, you can see are what is known as conodon elements. And these were what were always being found. And because they generally were preserved in phosphate or were a bit harder than the rest of the rock, they usually survived really well. And it was quite easy to extract those from the rock and to analyze them. <clears throat> but it wasn't until later on, in the 80s and 90s, 90s, with the discovery of conodon animals, actually soft body preservation of the animal itself, at places like the Grant and Shrimp Bed that scientists started to understand. So now we know that they, they were these sort of eel-looking look, eel creatures that had these mouth, uh, mouth like this. And it really, really reminds me, for anyone who watches the X-Files, the Fluke Man from the X-Files, 
Um, and yeah, they're really, really fascinating creatures, but you also get lots of shrimp there as well. Hence why uh, colloquially it's normally called the, the Granton shrimp beds. And this one on the right hand side here is an image of one that was found by Dr. Neil Clark from the Hunterian in 1984, and it is now in the collections of the Hunterian Museum. And the scale bar down here is one centimetre, and you can see here there is a shrimp over the top of it there, you can see its appendages, and this is the conodont animal here. Now that might not look like much, but the fact that this is preserved soft tissue is incredible. So when you think about it, soft tissue is not going to preserve very well. Normally with fossils, it's like the hard parts, it's the shells, it's the teeth and the bones, things like that that you get. So finding somewhere where you have this level of preservation is awesome. And here is a plate, and this is what we would call in sort of paleontology a sort of mass mortality plate. And usually in a lagger statin, that's kind of what you're seeing, that there's got to be some reason that these animals have become preserved so well. And there's a variety of environmental conditions and things that can happen to cause a site to be preserved as well. And in this instance, it's likely that there's been very, very rapid burial, but also due to the, the chemical conditions at the time and the, the chemistry of the sediment that it was being deposited in and those animals were in, allowing them to be preserved so well. And this plate is just absolutely full of them. And you can see that it just looks like they have been either covered very quickly by some sort of mud flow, um, just, just all preserved there as they would have been sort of swimming about. And then the next minute, they're all dead. And there you have this mass mortality plate. And these are a shrimp, a, a crustacean, sorry, known as water stonella. And here is another example of this, a uh, water stonella ella under a 365 nanometer UV light. And the reason that we look at fossils like this under UV is because it can be really good at picking out details that you wouldn't see under a uh, naked eye. And it just brings out some of the appendages a lot clearer. And to me, I just find it absolutely awesome that you can see, um, you know, you can clearly see that these are shrimps and, you know, they're 330 million years old. That's just awesome. And um, when I, you know, growing up, I always say this to people, I used to work in a prawn factory. So I worked with crustaceans as one of my first jobs. And I can definitely say that I prefer these crustaceans to the ones that I had to rip in half uh, in the fish factories. So um, growing up in a little place like Burmouth and in a fishing town is lovely, but you also do end up with some really weird part-time jobs as well as an interest in rocks, I guess. And here is another shrimp. This one is called Bear Drops Elgans. And this is also under UV light. This one is very, very hard to see, just nat sort of a natural light. Uh, so it's about, um, the image you're seeing is about eight centimeters long or 80 millimeters. And you can see that under UV, it's picking out the, the legs here the, and its appendages up here. And this is its tail there. And again, at this site, you can see there is this huge cross-cutting calcite vein going through the fossil as well. And this one um, is, is really, really beautiful. But as I say, to actually sort of see the fossil in person, like when you see it in person, it's really, really hard to pick up on the rock. So you kind of do need to use a different lighting source, but there's other ways to photograph and look at these fossils as well. So you can try photographing them underwater as well can work really well. And when you look at scientific papers that have been written on sort of soft tissue preservation, you'll notice that there is a lot of techniques that are employed to help and make it easier to pick out these details. But now I'm going to move on to <clears throat> the oil shales. So the oil shales, um, you've probably heard of these because the oil shale industry in Scotland was a very, very huge industry. And they are predominantly formed in aquatic environments, so seas or lakes, and they're normally carbonaceous, which means they have lots of carbon in them, essentially, and very fine grained rocks and are rich in organic matter. And that is what produces the shale oil when it's heated. And you can see evidence for this all around uh, sort of West Lothian and um, in isolated deposits in Mid Lothian and in Fife, uh, like in Burnt Island. So the image on the right is taken up the top of what's called the Ben Hill. This is the Ben Village in Burnt Island, which was the village that essentially served the old oil industry, the oil shale work there. And you can also find when you look through the old spoil heaps, which are also known as bings, 
you can find evidence of this past work where there's been drilling and things taking place and there's just so much really cool industrial sort of heritage to see there as well. And historically, oil shales were burnt in domestic fires like coal, but in the late 19th century, they were distilled to produce oil and other chemicals, and the industry was founded on James Young's invention of this process where you could obtain oil from bituminous coal. And in Scotland, our oil shales occur in the Strathclyde group, which are by sea in an age again. So we're still around about that, sort of 346 to 326 million years old. And the most notable deposits, as I said, are in West Lothian and in parts of South Lanarkshire, but also Mid Lothian and Fife. <clears throat> and um, the oil shales uh, occur and are associated with a lot of freshwater limestone, including one called the Birdie House limestone. And these represent freshwater environments within the oil shale formation across the Midland Valley of Scotland. And the freshwater limestones are really, really important because they can help us understand how algal oozes in these ancient, ancient lakes, which would have consisted mainly of uh, platonic al algae, um, how they went on to become the oil shales, like how that accumulated. And Loch Cadell that I mentioned before, uh, that would have been quite a shallow, probably less than 100 metres um, lake with gentle sloping margins. And it was stratified and non-mixing. So that means there would have been a uh, sort of distinct layers in the water column or chemistry uh, within that lake. And when the limestone was being deposited, it would have had to have been quite a close system. Now this limestone, the Birdie House limestone is a very pure uh, limestone. So it's a high calcium uh, limestone and was, was also utilized to be burnt for putty. So they burn limestone to make lime mortar. But in the case of the freshwater Birdie House limestone, it was highly, highly sought after as a non-hydraulic air lime because it was so pure and it made a really, really good lime putty. And it's an absolutely beautiful rock as well. And in this material, you find, um, because it's a limestone, you know, you're thinking water, you do still find some plant remains. And that's because where it was, it just was the right conditions. It was tropical uh, conditions. It was humid. The climate was just right for a varied, uh, a variety of flora and algae and plants and di diverse animal fauna, including fish and sharks, to thrive in these waters. And here what you can see is Lepidstrodus, which is a spore cone of something like a Lepidodendron tree. These were the big trees that grew in the Carboniferous and reached sort of 50, 60 metres in height. And uh, they reproduced, reproduced using these spores and spore cones. And they're really, really incredible. Some of the detail you can see is amazing. In some cases, they're actually piratized. Now, you can't really see this without using a microscope, but you probably will be able to see that that rock is covered in loads and loads of tiny white flags. And what those are, are ostracods. And ostracods tell us that this was a freshwater environment. So that's something else that we can look at to help us determine what type of rocks these are and what the environments were like. But in this environment as well, you did also get freshwater sharks. And I, um, current understanding of a lot of these is built on work done by Stan Wood. Um, there's a lot of new work being done as well. And uh, there are, here are some CT scans, which are super cool, of uh, the skull of a shark called Triscitius. I think I'm, pre I'm probably pronouncing that wrong but it's a medium-sized shark known from skeletal remains. And what's cool about that is that obviously sharks, to be sharks, are made of cartilage. They don't have bones. So that's why normally in the fossil record, you find lots and lots of shark teeth, but no actual articulated shark material. So it's quite rare to find that, but the interesting thing about the oil shales and the fossils you find there is quite a lot of the fossils actually end up preserved in ironstone nodules. And that means now that we have better techniques in science, we can actually do these CT scans, which in the past, you would essentially just have to crack that nodule open and hope for the best. But now they can actually be scanned without that being done. And that means that you're not likely to damage or lose any of that important material that you need. And um, yeah, it's just really cool to think that there's just all these really, really awesome creatures, you know, in the rocks that are around about places like Edinburgh. And you can't mention the nodules in the uh, oil shales without mentioning, obviously, wardy coprolites. Now, um, 
I've put a QR scan on here because I'm going to plug one of our geology events, which is happening on Friday and Saturday this week in Pit Lessie. Now we're doing a beach pebble event. We're going to bring the beach uh, inland to Pit Lessie, which is near Cooper in Fife. And if you would like to come along, the details are can be found on the website via the QR codes. But if you want to see some really cool fossils from around Fife and the Lothians, then come along because we will have lots of coprolites there. And um, these here are nodules. So the one on the left hand side is a coprolite nodule from Wardy, which has been sliced in half. And you can see in here, there's quite a lot of texture that you can see within these. This is one that's been sliced as well. This one hasn't, they've both not been polished actually. The one on the, this side is wet. Um, and this one has just been cut, but it's not been polished. Now the nodules themselves are siderite, which is an iron carbonate. And they are quite hard to cut because they get very muddy. They're, they can be quite soft and they make a lot of mess when you cut them. And I've just noticed this one still has barnacles in the bottom. And I would always recommend um, getting rid of the barnacles because if you forget about just one barnacle can make a hell of a lot of a smell. Um, so definitely recommended to, to clean those. But what's really fascinating about these coprolites is their structure. So when you look at this, you can see this spiral structure to them. And we know that a lot of modern sharks uh, have sort of spiral intestine, spiral digestive systems that cause them to do these sort of spiral shaped poo. And we know that that's likely a shark that produced those back in the Carboniferous. And there's sort of an interest in history to the Wardy nodules as well, because they're quite famous among paleontologists for the fact that William Buckland uh, made his table out of those. So it's in the Lyme Regis Museum and it's a coprolite table and he used these nodules cut and polished and inlaid them. And it's really, really cool. And one day I will definitely make one of those. But also within the oil shales, you find lots of different uh, fish as well. Now, the fossil record in the Carboniferous of Rayfin fish is actually quite rich, but one of the problems we have is that a lot of the time the material is heavily flattened and crushed, and it means information on any eternal anatomy is lacking. And that's why when you find them in a nodule or you can do the CT scanning procedure, non-invasive techniques to actually look at something in three dimensions is so much more useful. And a lot of the time when you find the fish, it's very unlikely that it's going to be completely articulated because if you think about modern times if you if a fish dies quite a lot of the time it's just going to rot or it's going to be predated on so something's going to eat it so there's not going to be a lot of it left to actually be preserved in the fossil record so it can be really really rare to find a perfect fish now finding scales and bits of scales and bits of fish is actually quite common in these rocks <clears throat> and uh, quite a lot of the time you will find just sort of splatters of articulated scales but you you don't find the full fish and um, there's some really really beautiful detail in some of the the stuff preserved from the birdie house limestone and it's just when you think about these environments you would have sort of been at the close close to the lake uh, margin where you would have been having some sort of terrestrial input you're getting vegetation from the land being washed in uh, periodically and being very well preserved as well and there's also uh, the ray finned fish called elenichthys um, it was just extinct, an extinct genus of bony fish, uh, which belongs to the class Actinopterygii. And the detail, as you can see as well, um, you know, more or less most of the fish is here, but again, you have that problem where it has been flattened. So this has been quite crushed and there is some beautiful uh, detail in the scales and in the, the fin here and the tail. But <clears throat> again, you have that whole issue of this really isn't going to tell you much about the internal structure or the anatomy of that animal. And you can see there is a little coprolite there. Um, I told you these rocks are absolutely full of uh, coprolites. It's brilliant. And that's one reason that scientists usually or paleontologists get really excited when they find coprolites because it means you're very likely to find other vertebrate remains as well. And then one of my favourites is a uh, rhizodont. So <clears throat> this is a tooth of what's known as a lobe finned fish called a rhizodont, uh, rhizodist, I can't say it anymore, rhizodist. 
and Fraser Riss could grow up to about six metres in length, rise on its could. That's, this reconstruction on the, the right shows what they would have looked like. Um, so they would have been really, really big predators in their time. Uh, they lived in fresh water and you, you probably wouldn't have liked to get close to one. Now, this teeth is relatively small. The teeth can get absolutely massive. I've seen images of some that, you know, they, they are huge. Uh, really, really cool, but they had these sort of classic, these are really sort of classic tooth looking like pointy and normally animals with teeth like this, uh, they use those to pierce their prey and it means they can sort of swallow them whole. And uh, yeah, there's a coprolite in the corner there as well. I'm just going to point them all out to you just to, to prove my point of how rich it is. Um, here's another coprolite from the oil shales as well, which is beside some plant material. So again, you're seeing those kind of combinations of environments and that's telling you a lot about what this environment was like when it was being deposited. So you think you've got your uh, fish and your sharks swimming about in this sort of freshwater environment and then periodically you're going to have uh, maybe a storm event where from the land you're getting these uh, different sort of branches and leaves and things getting brought into the water and also being preserved and quite a lot of the time they're preserved in pyrite which is really really beautiful so pyrite is fool's gold and it has that kind of shiny appearance and it looks really really incredible now in this copper like here um you might not be able to see very well, but there's a lot of these sort of black specks. And when you look at these under a microscope and start looking at them in detail, you can actually pick out a lot of features. So you can see things like uh, teeth of different animals that it was eaten. And you can also see like fish scales, but you can also sometimes see uh, bits of vegetation as well. So when you're looking at coprolites, you can sort of get a get, uh, a good idea of whether it was a carnivore or if it was an omnivore, things like that. But you're never really able to actually identify the species because it's very unlikely you're going to find the animal that did the poo next to its poo. So, um, but they are very, very important to help try and understand and look at the, the ecosystems of these different environments. But we didn't just have environments where there was, you know, big sort of animals like fish and sharks swimming about. We also had a lot of microorganisms and one of my favorite things is Carboniferous stromatolites, and that is because they are incredibly beautiful. Now this particular deposit occurs about 30 meters higher up in the succession from the freshwater Birdie House limestone. So that limestone that we've just been looking at that has the beautiful fish and uh, coprolites and things, and um, this is further up in the succession uh, from that. So it's a little bit younger. Now, these stromatolites are beautiful. This has been cut and polished uh, so that you can see the details really well, this banding. Now, stromatolites, I have got a picture of a modern stromatolite, which I think I'm going to go forward, forward to show you. So this is from uh, Lake Thesis in Western Australia, which I visited a few years ago. <clears throat> and this is on the edge of a lake. And these mounds that you can see are stromatolites. So there is very limited places um, in our sort of modern earth where stromatolites grow, but this is one of them. And really, really cool to see what is one essentially one of the oldest organisms on the planet. But just to go back to our carboniferous stromatolites, we have uh, one here which you can see. So what was happening uh, in this environment was um, the microbial carbonates grew around the edges of lochs and it probably would have been in quite shallow water, so it would be less than about 20 metres and the lochs would have been isolated and we think that they were probably isolated because of volcanic activity. So during the Carboniferous, um, we didn't just have a nice hot and humid climate, tropical seas and periods where uh, sea level rose, there was also a lot of volcanic activity and, you know, there was the, we were tectonically active at the time. So there's lots of really interesting locations where you can see evidence of this sort of interaction between sediment and the volcanic stuff. But here, what's really cool on this dramatically is you can see this is looking sort of at the bottom of it. And this green stuff, the greeny gray stuff you can see in here is volcanic tuff. And what these microorganisms did is they actually like to adhere to this volcanic tuff and they would grow around those. And this one has been polished slightly to bring out the detail, um, but they're really, really incredible. And they would grow in these little mounds. And you can see that if you were to cut one in half, you'd be able to see, but you can see it growing around. But the stromatolite sort of needs a substrate to grow on, normally some sort of 
uh, thing to start the growth or nucleation of growth. Um, and you can see here in this case, it was volcanic tuff. And you can see um, in the previous picture here, uh, the volcanic tuff and in here. So you can just see where it's growing from there. And it's just the detail in it is incredible. And these are uh, dollar stones. So the, the stone is a, a carbonate rock, but it consists mainly of uh, dolomite and uh, just the modern stromatolites again. And then into the more detail about sort of some of the volcanics that were happening during uh, this period in the Carboniferous, which affected a lot of the rocks around about it. So on the left hand side, you can see where this lava flow has come in on top of this sediment. And this area in here has just been completely altered. So the heat of that lava, as it was flowing across, has essentially changed the chemistry of those rocks. And a lot of it has been altered to something called white trap. And um, it's sort of a, it's a form of contact metamorphism where you get this change in chemistry or composition or texture caused by this extreme heat um, from these events. And on the right hand side, this is something that I've talked about before, but um, I love it and you can see it really nicely at this locality. This is uh, near uh, Burnt Island, which is in Fife, and the lava flow has essentially cooked the top layers of sediment. And in the top layers of sediment, you can see where all the coprolites have been baked white. So normally when you see them eh, from this locality, from the shales that haven't been really affected by the heat, that are lower down in the succession, they're normally quite buff colored. But then when you get higher up nearer to the lava flow, eh, they've just been totally cooked. And again, like you saw, um, it's sort of the cheese bay rocks and things, you're getting a lot of this calcite veining. And this is all just to do with these, um, the lava flows and the hot hydrothermal fluids and things that would have been, eh, sort of percolating through the rocks and and that's what deposits these calcite and things in the veins and here is another really nice example of a, a coprolite that's been baked so you can see that it's really really white sort of on the surface uh, there is some weather in there and again you've got these huge calcite veins and then you've got another coprolite here and another wee one here and just lots of flecks of and there's all sorts of uh, stuff in here which it would be great to look at this out uh, under a microscope which I'll hopefully be doing soon just to try and see if we can see any sort of micro fossils and things and um, really really cool and um I have another example of where it's been baked so this one here is from a uh, below this one. So this is from literally just underneath the lava flow. And you can see where this sediment has just been completely altered. So you're getting all this discoloration around the top. And you can, this is a coprolite on the top here. And you can just see basically how white that has gone and how baked it is. And it's just a really, really beautiful rock. And I can't wait to get some uh, thin sections made and to do some analysis on this, to look at the, the sedimentary sort of history of this rock. And it's not just the coprolites that get baked, uh, you also find baked fish. Um, and this is a really cool example of a carbon, carboniferous fish, um, which you can just see the detail and the preservation here. Now, this was found uh, by my friends while we were at that locality. So I was out hunting for jobbies, as I always am, and um, he was having a look at some of the material. So this material is really fragile at this location. And after a big storm, some had come out. And we didn't really think that you would find much in these really baked remains because you would think that it had been so hot that, you know, it, it would have kind of destroyed any of the, the sort of the details, essentially. But we found this. So it's very, very exciting because this is very recently. So uh, we'll be going back there really soon, hopefully to finish uh, my log that I'm doing of the area and to try and get a bit more detail about these sediments and what was going on with the, the volcanics and things as well. But you can just see how beautiful that is. And because it's been baked in the, the way it's preserved, the sort of phosphate has just turned this beautiful, beautiful white color and it just makes it stand out on this rock that has this sort of distinct, ready, quite dark color. It's very, very beautiful. And near this location as well, you also have some more stromatolites. And this is one of my favorites as well, because these stromatolites have undergone um, different periods of like deformation. So um, when the sediment was kind of coherent, so it wasn't yet a rock, but it was still kind of soft, but it wasn't just fresh, fresh sediment. There was some sort of folding that happens to these uh, stromatolitic layers and stromatolitic mounds. 
And after this, what I thought happened was that there was some sort of brecciation that happened because of just periodic drying out before they were completely consolidated. And there is some early diagenic cementation, which is, it is from that period. So before it became an actual rock, there was all these different events going on, but you can see how beautiful it is. Now, this is taken under UV light. Now, compared to the stromatolite I showed you, before this one when you look at it under normal light you actually don't see that much um sort of contrast in the colors like you do with the the previous one but this one here under uv light looks really really cool so you can see it's dolomitic and the, the dolomite and the calcite in there uh, fluoresces under uv really really nicely and here are some pictures of the stromatolite outcrop so this is looking sort of top down on a stromatolite and stromatolites like you've seen from the modern ones, grow in these mounds. And it was not really any different in the Carboniferous. Some of them could grow quite big, but you do get some very small mounds. And I found some sort of loose pieces of, of very small uh, stromatolites. And you can see on the right hand side here where you've had this like sort of this folding that's, hap that's clearly happened when the rock has not been consolidated yet, because you can see the overlying layers have not been affected there. And this part here um, is an outcrop, but it's really, really interesting to see if you can see the brecciation as well. And it's just a really, really, really beautiful rock. And now I'm going to move on to the marine environment. So I've talked a lot about sort of your freshwater environments and a uh, lake dell and things. And we know, as I said, during the Carboniferous that we did have a lot of uh, periods where there would be sort of shallow tropical seas and these were due to sort of periodic increases in the sea level and also just areas of the uh, sort of basins being cut off and becoming a, a marine sort of area and where I am in West Fife we have quite a few uh, outcrops of the marine limestone which is known as the Black Hall limestone and this is by CNN Age as well and this block here is about 30 centimeters in height and it's a crinoidal limestone, which is kind of on, um, it's almost on a nodule, which uh, I think is a sort of side right, so probably like another iron carbonate. It almost looks like this ball was like a ball of clay back in the Carboniferous that was rolling about the sea floor and picked up all these different fossils. And you can see these black things here are what are known as Cyvorus teeth. Now Cyvorus is my favorite shark. Um, for various reasons, but one of the reasons I like to show people Cybodus teeth is because in the Carboniferous, because sharks didn't have predators like they did in the Devonian, they didn't have those armoured fish as the sort of main predators in the ocean, it meant that they did kind of have the chance to go to sort of evolve all these sort of weird appendages and weird teeth shapes and things. And that was just because they were able to go into new areas of the environment and explore these new niches and sort of allowed them to, to sort of progress and evolve. And that's why the early Carboniferous or the Carboniferous is known as the golden age of sharks. It's because of this awesome sort of evolution that they went through. And these sharks you can see are, um, they have these pointy central cusps and then they have these uh, cusps at the side as well. Now, these types of teeth are known as primitive teeth uh, or a lot of people would know, uh, sort of refer them to as cladodon teeth. Um, but the primitive teeth are these ones where you, you have again that sort of classic um, pierce and swallow scenario where they use these teeth essentially to pierce their prey and then swallow it whole. So you probably wouldn't want to come across a Cyborus. So a Cyborus, uh, they could grow up to about uh, the size of a great white um, does today. So they would have been one of the kind of gnarly predators in the, the ocean at the time. And you can see it's also just really beautiful rock. So there's not just vertebrate material, the marine limestones in Scotland um, have a really, really diverse assemblage of uh, lots of marine invertebrates. And uh, these all tell us a lot about the conditions of the, the time as well. And here we have um, another sort of primitive shark tooth. We can see it looks quite similar to a Cybodus where you have that central cusp. 
And uh, this is known as Cladodus mirabilis, and this is from the Black Hole Limestone as well, and also from West Fife. And normally the teeth are preserved in uh, like a calcium phosphate, which is why they're, they sort of stand out from the rest of the limestone, which is car uh, calcium carbonate. Although a lot of our limestones here have uh, been affected by dolomitization as well. And the most common teeth that you find here is the uh, petalodont teeth. I'm just going to go back. I think my PowerPoint has got so many pictures in it that uh, it's not wanting to load very well, but you can still see the pictures. These are Petalodus acuminatus. And you can see on the left-hand side here, um, this is the crown. Oh, so that is what the animal would have used to uh, actually cut and slice its prey. So these petalodonts had quite thin teeth and they were called petalodont because petal, like a petal, is thin and flat like their teeth. And I can assure you that these teeth, even though they are uh, 330 million years old or so, um, are still incredibly sharp. And I have managed to cut myself on more than one occasion on fossil sharp teeth. Um, and the serrations on them, you can sort of see, I don't know how well you can see on the picture, but there is these little serrations here and on the edges of this, this one's been slightly chipped and on here as well. And this is just a, a reconstruction to show you. So the base here is like the root. So that's what would have uh, held it into the, the animal's mouth, to the shark's mouth. And yeah, they're really, really uh, awesome shark teeth and these are sort of the most common that you find are in the black hole limestone um, are uh, petalodont sharks or related to uh, petalodus. And here uh, we have another one which was prepped by my friend Sam and um, this was in a massive block of limestone that um, when it was found it was sort of broken in half and Sam has managed to stick it back together and sort of dig that fossil out of a lot of very, very hard crystalline limestone, which is just absolutely incredible. And you can see it's really, really beautiful limestone as well. So you've just got this shark teeth. If you can sort of imagine the environment of the time, so you've got these tropical shallow marine seas, which had coral reefs, not, they wouldn't have looked the same as like the Great Barrier Reef does today, but they would have been these sort of mines where you get this accumulation of sort of the, the early Carboniferous corals and you get crinoids, loads and loads of crinoids. You can see this limestone's made up with just sort of pretty much all of crinoids. Um, and you can see that one up there. I quite often get sent photos uh, of these, quite a good example of a crinoid stem, which has been put in uh, cut through in cross section. And quite often they'll just appear very circular. Um, but it's just nice to think about the association. So um, what's nice about the Carboniferous shark teeth is that when you find them uh, in the limestone, obviously they are in association with the other fossils. Uh, so you get an idea of what that environment was like and what that animal would have been living like. But the petalodonts would have been eaten because they have these slicing teeth. They would have been used for slicing like flesh of other fish or sharks that were swimming about as well. But it's not just vertebrates that you get in the limestone. Um, and I absolutely, anybody who knows me knows how much I love limestone and particularly crinoidal limestone. This bit on the left here, you can just see the detail on these crinoids. So these are the, the crinoid stem, which are made up of these ossicles. And down the middle of the stem, they have uh, what's called known as the lumen. And that's where like the sort of parts that would have connected and controlled the animal's movements and things like its central nervous system would have been housed. And then if you look at the rock here, you can see these sort of mats, and these are something known as bryozoans, uh, also called sea mats. Now bryozoans still exist today, and um, they're still modern bryozoans, and you can see them, they like to encrust on like seaweed and shells and things on the beach. And if you look at the, the modern ones and put them next to one of these fossil ones, it, honestly, you would not really be able to tell the difference. The preservation at some of these sites is just so, so great. And on the right hand here, side here, you have a brachiopod where um, the preservation again is just incredible. Um, you can still see the hinge. So uh, this is the sort of bottom valve and they're in the valve, valve underneath. So uh, brachiopods, um, are different to bivalves. So bivalves are a type of mollusk, whereas brachiopods are in their own phylum and um, their line of symmetry runs down the center of its valve, not between the two of its valves. 
and uh, yeah just to sort of think that that has managed to survive intact for over 300 million years is just really really cool and then we have uh, some more little fossils that you get. So here are some more crinoids where you can see uh, these are the uh, ossicles and everybody always sort of loves these kind of star shapes that you get with crinoids. Um, and here is one where the sort of central uh, area, the lumen has been weathered out and at least and it looks just like a polo mint or something. These star ones are not part of the crinoid's actual stem, they form part of the crinoid's cup or calyx and that is what would, the arms would have attached to. So the crinoid would have had a stem and then it's cup or calyx and the arms extended from there to uh, feed from the water column. And on the left hand side, you we have a gastropods and these sort of tall spiral gastropods, this one's called Loxanema. Um, these are actually quite rare in this particular limestone deposit. Some of the other black hole limestone sites, you do find them uh, more and that's just because it was slightly different conditions. So different uh, deepness of water, for example. Um, but it just shows that there's just this really, really great and sort of diverse uh, animal life that was around during this time. And on the left hand side here, we have some Dunbar marble. Now um, it's called Dunbar marble, despite it being a limestone, because marble was actually a term used to describe a stone that can be, uh, that can take a high polish basically. So as a, a decorative stone um, and Dunbar marble is absolutely beautiful. And it is, it's composed predominantly of solitary rugose corals. They're also known as horn corals. And the animal would have lived sort of in the center here. And um, this has sort of been cut in cross section, you can see. And if you want to go and have a look at some really, really beautiful examples of this, you can go to Skate Raw, which is near Torness. Um, it's the Skate Raw Lime Kiln. If you walk past that and walk towards Torness, you'll see that the, the sea defense there is actually made out of this limestone from round about Dunbar and some bits of the, the Dunbar marble bed there. Now, obviously, it's a, a sea defence, so please don't go and hammer any of those rocks or remove anything, but go along, have a look and take photos. It's a really, really brilliant place to go and actually see these fossils in situ and get an idea of what these ancient marine environments were like. And then on the right hand side, we have some more crinoidal limestone and you can see these sea mats or bryzoans encrusting on top of some of these. And again, detail you have here is just incredible. Now, the reason that we get crinoidal limestone like this is because uh, crinoids were quite fragile. So when they died, their stems got broken up very, very easily. And that was usually the bit that survived. So you end up with this big sort of chaotic jumble of bits of crinoid and it's just really beautiful that it's weathered this way and you can just see that beautiful detail with all those bryozoans and things and then because I also love coral eh, I just wanted to sort of show you some of the diversity of eh, the different colors of limestone so a lot of people always ask me um, how do you know it's limestone or what color is limestone normally now that is, is a really good question, but it's really hard to answer because limestone is so incredibly variable. It's like, I mean, sandstone is really variable, uh, limestone is as well, and that is to do with obviously the, the mineralogy, so the, the components that make up that limestone, but also the conditions that it's undergone since it's been deposited. Um, but these are both uh, early Carboniferous limestones, both full of colonial rugose corals, um, one, the one on the left hand side is from uh, Burnmouth, so that's from down in the Scottish borders, and the one on the right hand side is from uh, near Dunbar Way, and you can see how different these are, and um, a lot of the rocks, I've said the limestones here have undergone something called dolomitization, so it means that they uh, usually have a lot of magnesium carbonate in there as well, and they're just so beautiful. These sections have been cut. Uh, they've not been polished, but they've just been sliced so that you can see that internal structure. Um, and there is a bit of a rugose coral in there. So that, that looks a wee bit like a shrimp, but that is just the way that you're looking at a, a solitary rugose coral that's in cross section. And then some more examples of limestone here. Um, the right hand side, this is a bit from the limestone from where I live. And this is really, really useful for me because I've been mapping this limestone and this coral bed occurs at the same bit in the formation. So 
uh, depending on where I am, I can look for this to try and work out where I am in the formation and how high up I am. And it's very, very useful for locating yourself. On the left hand side, you have this really, really beautiful uh, piece of cut limestone um, with rugose corals in there. And then these little sort of semicircular things are uh, brachiopods in cross section. It's their shells that are, are in cross section. And the, you can see the detail in here is incredible. But what I love as well is the actual, the matrix of the, the limestone itself and the colors that you can see in there. And this is all to do with how that carbonate was precipitated. So limestones are calcium carbonate and are made up from usually the skeletal remains of uh, calcium carbonate organisms, but can be uh, precipitated by things like uh, microorganisms and algae and things. And now I'm going to jump a bit over to the West Coast very quickly, or over to the West, not to the West Coast, to Fossil Grove. Because I can't mention sort of the Carboniferous without talking about Fossil Grove. And Fossil Grove is in Victoria Park in Glasgow. And um, the, you can see there is a building around that and the grove was built and it was one of the first examples of a museum built for geoconservation purposes in the world, which is really, really cool. And there's been some amazing work by uh, David Webster and the Fossil Grove Trust to get a uh, Fossil Grove sort of open again and on Saturday if you're in Glasgow we have a Scottish Geology Trust event at Fossil Grove so I think it starts at 12 but I put the QR code there and it's on the website so if you're in the Glasgow area please do come along and um, I'll be there with some coprolites as always and there'll be lots of other activities and things and this place has been you know, it's been closed for quite a while and a lot of people say that they remember visiting as a kid and it is a spectacular place. There's like 11 of these stumps that you can see and it's just so cool to kind of imagine you're just standing there in this ancient environment and it would be lovely to see loads of people uh, there and they're also open on Sunday for a doors open day as well and all the details if you google the Fossil Grove Trust it'll come up on their website. And then I want to talk about the trace fossil, which was the uh, event photo image that I chose. And this is one that I went to visit recently when uh, I went to see my friend Dagmar and she lives in St Andrews. So we went for a walk along the beach, very near to our house. And you're just confronted with this absolutely amazing trace fossil. Now, this might not look like much, but Hopefully you can see that there is three very distinct lines and now there's one here and then there's one underneath and then there's this one in the centre and my hands are on the top of it there. And this is an early Carboniferous Eurypterid uh, or sea scorpion and um, this could get up to about two metres in length. And the reconstruction is from a paper by Martin White from 2005 on uh, the right hand side here, you can see what it would have looked like. Now what you're seeing in this trace fossil, which is just so, so cool, is that the middle bit is basically where this sea scorpion had come out of the water and was going along a sort of wet sandy plain and was dragging its tail along that soft sand and it's just that moment that's preserved in time and there's other uh, trackways of a giant millipede as well that you can see nearby at St Andrews uh, really really worth uh, going to visit and the paper is freely available as well online if you google and um, just uh, Google the Eurypterid Trace Fossil St Andrews uh, and it should come up for you. But you can see here where they've sort of drawn out the different uh, trackways there. But just thinking about that image on the bottom, imagine, you know, one that was sort of, I think the one from this trackway is estimated to have been about 1.6 metres in length, which is just huge. Imagine that just walking along the beach towards you. Um, yeah, pretty incredible. So it's well worth if you're ever in the St Andrews area having a wee wander down the beach to try and find these. But I'm going to finish up now because I am now at this point plugging the Scottish Geology Festival events. And uh, yeah, I'm going to have the last slide there was just um, a slide to show the date of the festival, which I'm sure everybody knows by now. But thank you very much for everyone listening so far, and I hope people have some questions.